I discovered that concreteness in the thought I was pursuing meant a debilitating solitude. At the same time, translating this thought for a possible confrontation with well-minded liberalism and the many debilitating forms of correctness in a time when the enterprise of theory seemed increasingly trivial and philosophically bankrupt held little promise. The failure to which I referred above lies somewhere in that dilemma. Returning to Europe undoubtedly meant regaining the possibility of advancing with my guiding questions, however modest, in the languages in which they had been formed. But I continue to sense that I've experienced in Europe something like a call to thinking of another order. And here I rejoin Ganem. I speak with little surety here, I mean, and this is really very <laughs> sort of sketchy. <clears throat> But I can do little more than suggest that what strikes me as an American in Europe is the specific character of the relation to linguistic and sociocultural difference. These dimensions of European experience seem more richly available to Europeans than comparable phenomena are, generally, to most Americans. I can only conclude, and this is hardly a novel observation, that Europe's history is present to its peoples in a way that quite differs from the North American experience, that a different experience of temporality prevails here. The result is that the historicality of being in the world and the material conditions of this being, or simply its facticity, the fact of being in the world, if I may, if I may put it that way, are more manifest in the European context, or differently manifest anyway, than they are in North America. To restate this very abruptly, and crudely really, the presence of European history as a history of multiple peoples with their specific linguistic and cultural usages brings the world, or being in the world, to the fore in a way one finds primarily only in minority communities in the United States. This presence of the facticity of being is what calls for thought in Europe in a singular way, and it is perhaps what makes it possible for Garnel to claim that Europe is called to conceive a different destiny than the one that has unfolded recently in America, whether or not one can agree with him in the statement that the latter destiny has, inf has involved the ablation of human finitude, of political being, and of fundamental thinking. Drawing together the last point and my rather loose remarks about the European discursive order, I believe one still has grounds to look to Europe for coming articulations of its idea, new articulations of being in common. Europe surely has its future possibilities, possibilities that cannot be foreseen as, in as much as they proceed from the event of truth, of thought. <laughs> I've been talking about truth all day. In this sense, philosophy will have a future in Europe, I'm sure of it, and this fact reinforces my sense that this is as good a place to call home, as far as my work goes, as any I will probably ever find. But I do not believe that contributing to the idea of Europe by practicing philosophy in Europe will give me, anyway, a sense of a discovered ethos, at least not directly. If I continue to find that it is possible to dwell here as someone attempting the task of thinking, it will only ever be as a guest seeking to get a grip on the facticity of my being and the question of facticity itself in that very peculiar manner proper to the expatriate who negotiates daily the complex structures of hospitality. At home in Europe, philosophically, I will never be quite at home. And this paradoxically may make it possible to find something like a free usage of thought that engages something like an ethos. There will be jobs to accomplish from my place in the university and in the name of the humanities, and these will have their particular meaning in this European site. They will inevitably answer in various ways to the idea of Europe. But any advance in my own thinking, and the possibility of such a thing is what brought me here, any step in that dwelling that thought becomes when it is underway will derive from a displaced practice of the so-called continental thinking I pursue. In such displacement or estrangement, the practice of thinking at least in my experience, can become a practice of remembrance. And this ultimately is why I believe I am more at home in Europe as a thinker than in the country that I identify unhesitatingly as home. Let me be frank in saying that I cannot pretend to master the complexities of this structure. I have returned to the historical origin of the kind of thinking I pursue in order to enjoy a, kind, a sense of discursive propriety and symbolic per pertinence in my work in the simple sense that the philosophy I practice can mean something in Europe in a way that I have not experienced in North America. And I feel that my work can bear all the greater a charge of sense in that it speaks most immediately to a particular experience of historicity that is available here, a particular experience of worldhood. 
But it is only because this world is not quite my own that engagement with it pushes me back into a process of, re of remembrance and thus a hint of that thing that Heidegger terms an ethos. In the most radical moments of foreignness or estrangement, I am reminded of the Jew who moves through the mountains of Hölderlin and Nietzsche's Zarathustra in Ceylon's prose poem, Conversation in the Mountains. And I recall this in part because I discussed this text here seven years ago, I believe. Um, I do not mean to claim for myself an equally radical experience of remembrance, but I sense that I am approaching something like a practice of time as I seek to advance, however haltingly, in my thinking. I experience historicity, to put it simply, and from there, like Ceylon's Jew, I can begin to glimpse new relations. The everyday reality is hardly so exalted, to be sure. But the question I have tried to ask regards my experience of the place and time of the thought I have shared with the person to whom I address this text. <laughs> I'll be eager to hear his answer, trusting that its precise shape may depend on the site in which it is delivered, Scotland, say, or New York. Thank you. Introduced him so sketchily in the beginning only because everybody knows him. Right? He studied in the first year and second year. There was nicht, nobody can escape him in this uh, school. He says, No way to get around this way of questioning Heidegger. And I always say this miracle to bring Heidegger to, to life and make it even, uh, yeah, not a nice guy. He's probably never a nice guy, but somebody you cannot avoid. <laughs> you have to go through it. You know, that's always. Amazing. All you know, I did my dissertation on Heidegger and hate him very much. Also. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. best to work on someone you don't like. But the point here is, I think, what you raised today is very interesting uh, because it is, as you guessed and sensed, for our mostly American students, but this time we have also students from many other countries, but still the majority, EGS, is still uh, American. Why are they coming here? And why, for example, could I make a living in New York, you know, with my kind of pitch in English? Uh, because actually, exactly that, because he trusted and believed that I know something the other American professors don't know. And the fact that they don't understand what I'm talking about, and I think it's easy to bring in this mix, you know, just add it to my, uh, you know, what's that called? Uh, reputation or what you call it, or let's put it the other way, everybody who asked me nicht, if I could not learn better English after over 20 years in America actually, nicht, is, nicht, would you believe I'm a philosopher if I had not this heavy German accent? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the point. So why is that so? Because on the other hand, everybody who has nicht, lived in both countries knows also about the narrow-mindedness of the European academia. You know, what kind of series where you cannot make a joke and cannot laugh and do nothing, you know. So people like me, they always say, Wolfgang, go to America. Mm -hmm. Only in America you become a European. Because, oh, Wolfgang, so, so, so German. <laughs> <laughs> and there I could make jokes. I can be a stand-up philosopher. Uh, it does not make any difference. They still believe I know something. You know? So, but I know something. Maybe only know that I don't know, but this is already a good start. So, in some way, you are, in, have, you are live in between, <coughs> yes, but this in betweenness gives you the best from both worlds. It gives you the irreverence, the open mindedness, the, the, yeah, the humor you can have in an American system. There are no kings, no? Not in, yeah. everybody is the same bum, you know. So, this is. Uh, yeah. You have no idea of the hierarchy of a, of a German, this is why I always said people either call me Wolfgang or call me Herr Professor Dr. Schirmacher. Huh? <laughs> and on phone forget one piece of my title. Because you know? <laughs> otherwise you are not existing. So this kind nobody wants that. And still the question is, Heidegger was such an academic. Heidegger was so, had no humor whatsoever, you know, was not able to spontaneously discuss with anybody, 